Universalist Congregation of Princeton, where in our open and welcoming community, we live our message of hope, love, justice, and joy. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. We're really happy that you've joined us. And if you haven't already stopped by the newcomer table, please do so after worship so that we can get you any information that you like about our congregation and put you on our e-list so that you'll get announcements about what we have going on here. Again, welcome everyone to UU Princeton this morning. We have a few announcements. The first is, can you imagine only eating bland pantry staples without seasoning day after day? Many of the families who depend on Arm and Arm and other local food assistance programs live in food deserts where they cannot buy spices at affordable prices. And many also suffer from high blood pressure and should limit sodium and salt in their diets. Spices and salt-free seasoning mixes help them, help them make their food healthier and more satisfying. And today you can help with all this. After the service in the founder's room, which is where we have brunch, we will pack up 17 different bulk spices into individual baggies that will be delivered to Arm & Arm later this week for their mobile food pantry. Children are welcome with an adult helper and supervisor. This is organized by our UU Princeton Social Justice Caring for Our Neighbors Ministry, and in particular, Louise Senior, who's in the back. You can check in with her if you need more information after the service. And thanks in advance for helping with this great, great outreach project. Also after worship, next door to the Founders Room in the Murray Room is Exploring Our Faith, a casual, conversational, 60-minute introduction to UU Princeton and Unitarian Universalism. You can bring your questions or just be part of the conversation. All are welcome, whether you're newer to our congregation or have been here longer. And next week, all are invited to our Zen practice and Dharma talk after worship. This is the one that was postponed from last week due to illness, but it is on for next Sunday from 1145 to 1245. And now with a word about our annual fellowship auction, Aparnazama. Good morning. So are there any fans of the show Golden Girls here? So I'm channeling Sophia Petrillo here. Picture this. <laughs> it was 2020. It was a nice Saturday evening and everything was beautiful. It was right here in Channing. We had tables out. We had people walking around with plates full of delicious finger foods, desserts, a glass of wine or many, with some jazz music playing in the background. And then people were bidding on various auction items that was basically setting up their entire social calendar for the year. And then the pandemic happened. No more parties. We still had the auction online, but no more drinking in Channing. 2020 happened to be the last leap year. And here we are four years later, another leap year. Only this time, the UUCP Fellowship Auction Committee is collaborating with the celebrations uh, ministry, and we are going to bring the in-person kickoff party for the auction. So what we are hoping to do here is bring back all the fun, all the fun, and maybe double or triple it. For those of you who are new to this, because you joined us, or maybe you didn't attend the previous ones, it's basically a fundraising opportunity. All the proceeds go to UUCP. And uh, this is also an opportunity where you get to bring your gifts to the community and share them. So when is it? This is on March 2nd, five o'clock. And if you're like, oh my, I have other plans, cancel them. Come to this one because this is going to be so much fun um, that why go anywhere else? So the one big thing that we're going to do differently this year 
as we're going to start off the kickoff with the kickoff party here. Um, and in fact, today is the day that you should turn in your uh, items, your donation items. Uh, the link is on our website, or you can email Candice Hedberg. Um, what you could also do is take your time, maybe in a day or two, if you're just hearing about this, then think of things that you could offer to the auction and please uh, send the information to Candice. So we are going to have the kickoff party March 2nd, five o'clock here, but then we'll keep bidding till March 10th. So we're going to have best of both worlds, the fun at the beginning, and then we're going to finish up the auction on March 10th. Please remember, this is a major fundraiser for the fellowship. Um, also on that night, March 2nd, you can take away uh, lots of items. You don't have to wait till March 10th. So you, there'll be raffle baskets. You can talk to Meg Cox about them. Uh, there's going to be cheese, wine, chocolate, all kinds of baskets. There's going to be art that you can take away that night, so on and so forth. So there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Don't miss the action. So now I could say, what's the value proposition for anyone? So I want to talk to you about the Zamas value proposition. So as you may know us as Maya's parents, uh, but Farooq and I have been married close to 23 years now. He was raised Muslim, I was raised Hindu, and we thought we were a small, lonely tribe. And um, in this auction, uh, for the very first time, we offered something called the Tiffin Party, because I like to cook. And I like to make Indian snacks that my kids don't like to eat, but we like them. So I thought maybe, okay, we'll take a chance and we offered the Tiffin Party. And uh, the Nigams, now I'd seen the Nigams in church previously, but they really generously bid on our item and they came to visit us. That was the first time I had a full length conversation with Raj and Elaine. And then we discovered our tribe got bigger. They had a similar story from 40 years prior. And you have no idea when you discover that, wait a minute, <laughs> there, there, there can be a successful story here. And we had such lovely conversations. And at the end, Raj said of that evening, he said, now we know you a little bit better. And I was like, yes. And that is the value proposition. When you come to the fellowship auction, that is how we get to know each other a little bit better. Because collectively, we are all bringing our gifts, to our time, our affection, and building out our tribe. So please cancel all other plans. Come here, March 2nd, 5 o'clock. Thank you. Our chalice words this morning come from Ray Oldenburg's article, The Vanishing Third Place. The great boon to friendship is that which is often called neutral ground, and third places represent the best of it. On neutral ground, people avoid the obligations of both guest and host and simply enjoy the company. There's an atmosphere of acceptance and belonging that no single friend, no matter how close, can provide. Our prayer this morning is a version of the loving kindness meditation in Buddhism. I invite you to close your eyes and take a few deep breaths, settle into your seat, and let each breath be a little deeper than the last and each exhale a little fuller than the last. And as you breathe from the top of your head to your face and your neck, think, relax. Relax your shoulders and your arms. Relax your hands and your fingers. Fill your lungs with breath and relax your chest. Let your belly relax, your hips, your legs, your feet. Wiggle your toes and let them relax. And for your head and face and neck, your shoulders and arms, your hands and fingers, your lungs and chest. 
your belly and hips and legs and feet and toes, your whole body. Hold in your heart gratitude for this meeting place of earth and stars, uniquely your home, uniquely yours. And say to yourself, may I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I be loving. May I be kind. And holding in your heart the presence of someone you love, say to them, may you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be loving. May you be kind. And holding in your heart a stranger on the street, say to them, may you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be loving. May you be kind. And holding in your heart someone you don't like, say to them, may you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be loving. May you be kind. And from our gratitude, our bodies, our spirits, and our collected breath, let us wish to all, may all be happy. May all be peaceful. May all be loving. And may all be kind. May it be so, and amen. The internet leads to nothing but lust and discord. I can't take credit for those wise, sarcastic words. Uh, they belong to my friend, Kristen Weber, a writer, a mother, and most particularly, a fan of the Boston Red Sox. Pausing here for booze. You can still see those words today on a picture dated August 2007, but probably taken about a year earlier, uh, autumn 2006, on a cold sidewalk somewhere in Brookline or Boston. But they apply only in the inverse to the community, community represented in those eight or nine people on that street corner and to the message board where we all met. The board called Surviving Grady, attached to a Red Sox fan blog of the same name, had been formed well before I joined that community in spring of 2004. I was simultaneously a returning Boston native and a Jersey college student transplant. We all watched games together, uh, together, posting online as we went from our respective houses. And then that moved to a bar in Kenmore Square, Crossroads, sadly now closed. And uh, even a few times together at Fenway Park, I can say definitively that there were several marriages, a few friendships, and maybe a few friendship breakups that led directly from this online group. As far as I know, it survives to this day, a testament to the power of shared community. Yes, the internet, as Kristen summed it up, has always had the reputation for souring all that is worst in humanity to a particularly rancid curdle. And the intervening 20 years haven't given many arguments to the contrary. But still, I have to say, the internet has at various points saved and may yet again save my life. Because Surviving Grady was only my first adult experience on the internet of what sociologist Ray Oldenborg calls a third place. A place, as he said, where I could be a, quote, regular without being judged against a standard or an ideal person, at least as far as I knew. As a weird kid with a capital W, like weird Barbie, it was always hard making friends at school out of, outside of structured activities like music or theater. I loved talking about some very specific things way too much and cared not enough to talk about others. Too many times going up to someone new at recess or lunch and getting a disgusted look when you try to start a conversation can really wean you of the desire. However, at age 13 or 14, something amazing happened. We got home internet, later than some, earlier than others. And I discovered Usenet groups, 
message boards and this great website called Television Without Pity, or TWAP, as we acronymed it. These were places where people didn't mind that I could go on for hours and hours about the vagaries of the new Battlestar Galactica, or spin ideas, later to be written up into fanfic, about what my favorite characters on the West Wing got up in between episodes. All that was required to be a regular was to sign into the forums every Wednesday night after a new episode, or maybe Thursday before my homework had to be done, under my username. But that username was very important, because those online forums didn't make you be who you were at school every day. They did require that you be a good person. Treat your fellow posters with, with respect. No flame wars, as we still say. As a teenager still learning how to be a person, this kind of walled garden was a really safe place to test out who I wanted to become, not just the eldest daughter, cousin, granddaughter in my extended family, or the nerdy kid who loved English and history at school that maybe wasn't always just quite there. TWAP gave me a sense of who I was outside of those two luckily loving but often rigid contexts. And TWAP also introduced me to one of my best friends, though we wouldn't know that until about eight years later. It taught me something else about third places, how you cope with those places at their lowest ebb or even at their ending is at least as important to who you are as how you behave at their height. In the case of TWAP, I just simply outgrew it. I wasn't there when the site was sold in the mid 2010s, the forums archived on to live like frozen topiary. I tried to keep touch with my surviving Grady friends on Facebook when I moved back from Boston to New Jersey after college. At some point in 2021, I figured that I had been in at least six or seven separate internet communities sequentially in the last couple decades. The re reason my best friend Drea and I are still best friends today, after meeting online in 2005, is that we ended up crossing paths in at least three of them before ever living in the same city. The best internet communities don't just give you the confidence to be your best self there. They give you the confidence to take what you've learned and bring it out into the world. One place, a message board built around the work of one of my favorite cultural critics, was a place just post-pandemic where I met people who encouraged me to get out there in the world, find my own IRL third places. One of those places ended up being UUCP. But that online forum, too, also just lasted two, sh just short of two years imploding in spectacular fashion last February into many different spin-off communities. It's important to recognize how to build these third places to su sustain themselves, internet or not, to regenerate year after year and serve the folks who are a little more like you used to be. But the point of them, why they are third in the first place, is that no one version of you the one at home or school or work is sufficient to encompass who you are. May we all find our fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh places if we are so lucky. Well, speaking of friends and of Boston, several years ago, I was in Boston attending a multi-day church seminar. We were quite busy during the daytime, but quite free in the evening. So one night, a few of us decided to do a very touristy thing and visit the bar that was visually the setting for the TV show Cheers. It was within a walk of where we were staying, and we had all watched that show growing up and thought it would be fun and nostalgic to visit the bar that was imagined as the setting. I say imagined because they showed the outside of this particular bar during the theme song, but the show was really shot on a set in L.A., we were to imagine that the show was actually shot in that bar in Boston, which I confess is what I thought when I went to visit it. I thought we were visiting the bar where they actually made the show. No, we were just visiting the outside of the bar in which we were to imagine the show being filmed. I'm not going to lie, I was a little let down by that. But it was still fun to be out and about with friends new and old on a beautiful Boston night. That theme song from Cheers was very well known. In particular, it had a famous refrain that goes, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. 
You want to be where everyone knows your name. <laughs> if you grew up with that show, that song never, never leaves you. Cheers ran in the 80s and 90s and spun off Frasier, which ran in the 90s to the early 2000s. Cheers was about a group of friends who frequented or owned or worked at this bar in Boston. They bonded over major life events, minute daily observations, love, breakups, past glories, and current difficulties. Some characters came and went, but several stayed throughout the run of the show. And the setting remained that same bar, where many of the same people sat in the same seats each episode or worked in the same positions, and the banter and the whole feel quickly became familiar and very comfortable. It was a sitcom about a group of people who seemed to be friends more than customers and employees. One got the impression that they gathered frequently and they definitely knew a great deal about each other's lives. They were comfortable with each other and comfortable in that space and that created senses of dependability and intimacy. It was an example of a third place, which is a term used in sociology to describe the location usually other than home and work where people primarily find connection and a sense of place. It could be a bar with regulars, a book group, a band or choir, barbershop or beauty salon, playing a sport or rooting with others of the same rooting interest, etc. Today, they can be online communities, although that wasn't the case when the term was developed and definitely not the case back when Cheers was filmed. And of course, a very common third place in much of the literature is a religious community, a church or synagogue or mosque or congregation of some shared faith where people gather and grow in community together. Ray Oldenburg, the sociologist that Emma mentioned earlier, developed a bunch of characteristics that third places share. Some of them are that they occur on neutral ground where there is some sort of leveling of status. There can be different roles, but socioeconomic or educational status really shouldn't matter, certainly not as much as it does in other aspects of life. Third places should feel cozy and kind of playful in the sense that much of the community building is casual and conversational. The flow is more spiral than linear. People circle around memories and stories, retelling them again and again, and often adding to them over time. Though the group may be committed to a big goal or a singular purpose, the process of reaching for that goal and purpose remains rooted in friendship, which brings the joy. Conversation is the main activity of a third place, even if the gathering itself is around microbrewing or getting your hair done or playing a game or planning a concert, conversation is the main component of that third place. And among a few other characteristics that Oldenburg delineates is the idea that the third place feels like a home away from home. That doesn't mean that it feels like home. There's only one of those. And if the third place were home, it wouldn't be a third place. It would be the first one. But it has a home-like feeling, a place where you are known, can know others, and can experience a kind of familiar, cozy joy, even when in pursuit of a dream or a goal. This adds a sense of place and support in life, especially when the third place accents a healthy and affirming first place with appropriate maturity and boundaries. And if one's home is not the sort of space that, attend, that one attends with affection and appreciation, if home wasn't a good place for someone, the third place will either replicate the toxicities of that first place, or the person will choose third, fourth, fifth, et cetera, places that are healthy and appreciative and bring joy to life in response to what went wrong in the first place, or at least wrong with part of it. If a kid grows up in a home where they are harshly judged for this or that or expected to succeed at all costs, they may, early on, seek third places that replicate those harmful senses, only to turn from them later on and seek, or sometimes build, third places that create the first place that they wish they had growing up. They become wounded healers, in a way, using third places to fill voids left by their first one, but the process of getting there can be really difficult. This help ex helps explain why people sometimes join destructive third places and stay there because it may be what they know best. And it helps explain why some eventually leave those destructive places so that they're not replicating wounding, wounding but are instead creating healing places. This happens in religious communities all the time. 
people raised in harsh and judgmental religious communities may become adults who lead them, or they may become adults who leave them and never return. Or sometimes they join and strengthen a different religious community that operates with values and expressions that they affirm and appreciate now in adulthood, but weren't able to experience as a child. Or think of youth sports. I once watched a grown adult Little League baseball coach of second and third graders get tossed from a game because he threw a fit at the umpire. His player had been called out on strikes and he launched into this ump who himself was all of 18 or 19 years old as though this call had cost him the World Series. And when the ump rightfully booted him, he refused to leave until some of the parents left the stands to sort of shepherd him toward the parking lot away from the kids who were witnessing exactly how not to behave. I didn't know the coach, but I wouldn't be shocked if he was replicating, perhaps in an enhanced way, but still modeling behavior he witnessed in his first place, or at school with a coach, his second place, perhaps. And I can only hope. In fact, I faithfully believe that sooner or later, he'll turn from that behavior and become the coach the kids need, encouraging, reasoned, flexible, and focused on having fun and team building. I believe he'll be that coach and provide that, thir that good third place to kids someday if he isn't doing so already, but he has to drop some baggage from another place to get there. It's because of all this, I think that third places are best thought of as Venn diagrams where the circles overlap other than, rather than lists of one, two, and three. The circles aren't the same size and aren't drawn at the same time, and sometimes they change, and there are often way more than three, but they all intersect somewhere. Each highlights a strength or answers a weakness of another. All our places are interconnected in some or many ways, and understanding those connections can bring insight to what each offers and teaches us, and they can help us offer those places to others who seek joy, healing, and a safe place. Our congregation, as a third place, offers friendship and healing and purpose. We gather to bless one another and our neighbors and the stranger, and we do so primarily through our relationships. We grow and work together as we enliven common acts of compassion and service in the world. The spiritual diversity, oops, we're there. We lose it. Let me get that. Is this one on? Is this working? Let's try this one. Judy, can you give a look? Is this? Oh, yeah, let's try that one. Test, test, test. Test, test. Oh. Test. Test, test. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I didn't see you back there. Thank you for fixing that for us. <laughs> All right. Where were we? The spiritual diversity that we embrace is for some a reflection of long-held values expressed in other circles of life. For some, it counters a stricter sense of one orthodoxy or another that disallowed different understandings and opinions. Our progressive religious take on this and that and everything for some meets long-held sensibilities. For other, it is a welcome change from more conservative religious beliefs that judges the sorts of things we embrace. Our multi-generational ministries reflect for some an upbringing that was even more multi-generational than ours is. For others, it answers a wish for kids and grown-ups to know and bless each other. And all of this is relational built by and through our relationships with one another. Oldenburg, who passed away in 2022, would call this the conversational part of third places. But the conversations here build relationships, which is what many people crave, and they're what power everything we do. We have this desire to know and to be known in joy and in deepening and widening circles of friendship. There is this human instinct to not go it alone, at least not all the time, but to instead be included in communities of like mind, like heart, and like interest. We want to grow together, to not be alone or lonely, but to be connected with larger life. We don't 
all want the connections at the same level or with the same intensity, but many and many of us need our time alone to decompress, to think, and to recharge. But just as Thoreau left his solitary stretch in a celebrated cabin where he lived deeply and sucked the marrow out of life, or tried to, to rejoin various circles of life, so too do we, who need time by ourselves, also crave time among others and the relationships that bring us a sense of place and joy. The pagan writer Starhawk speaks to this when she writes, we are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned, we can only catch glimpses of from time to time, community. She continues, somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. And she concludes, community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that must be done. Arms to hold us when we falter, a circle of healing, a circle of friends, somewhere where we can be free. She speaks of eyes lighting up when we enter. And we know that feeling of seeing someone enter a room and being filled with joy just because they're there. But we don't always know that we've brought that same feeling to other people as well. We have all caused eyes to light up in joy. We have all just with our presence filled hearts in a room with love and kindness. We have all been that blessing, but we don't all know it because we don't say it. You just can't move around a lot because this stiff. Enough. That's why you can't we do it. Should. For we are a faith of words. It's still red. It's a faith of many, many words. Yeah. Oldenburg would look at us and say that we have oh, that conversation that thing down. And he'd yeah. probably say that we're good at being joyful too. But we should use those blessings to appreciate each other more often and not on the inside, outwardly, with words. We can let people know that we light up when they're here, or even just that we're happy that they're here, that our day is better for the few moments that we have together. And that might be the only time the person you're conversing with hears it, that week, that month, that year, in years. That affirmation is too powerful to keep with me. And we should share it whenever we can. And if we practice that here, we'll do it more in the larger world too. We'll spread those affirmations far and wide, going from circle to circle to circle, first, second, third, a hundredth places. I'm sorry. Bringing to life more relationships in which people feel valued and good and embraced. Our faith, which we build and grow together, will, will, will spread beyond these walls and become well, known in the joy and affirmation well, that it creates in every nice. single place. Okay. That visit to the Cheers bar was not quite what I had hyped it up to be. Nobody said my name when I walked in. I was just a customer, one of countless customers over the years. At one point, that bar was the third most popular tourist attraction in Boston, which if you think about everything that is in Boston could be a little depressing, but then again, with an evening free, that's exactly where I went. But even though there was no Sam or Diane or Coach or Carla or Norm or Cliff, I still had a beverage and some bar food and shared some good time with new friends and old friends. And then we walked back to where we were staying, and one of my closest friends broke out some board games that he had brought with him. I'm not a big board game guy, but I can play along if someone else leads. And we stayed up late into the night playing laughing, eating junk food, and taking our turns. I deepened some old friendships. I made some new ones. There was peace and joy. And by the end of our time in that small circle, indeed, everyone knew my name. May we create those places here so that we can help create them everywhere, so that everyone can feel known and appreciated and understood in this world. For when that happens, all places become peaceful. All places become just, and all places become loving. May it be so, and amen. And at the end of our hour, we extinguish our chalice, knowing that its light carries us until we gather again. Go forth grateful for the moments before you, direct within you, the people among you, and the spirit guiding you toward lives of love and kindness. And go forth knowing that you are held always and always with everyone else by that great love of no beginning and never ending. Go in peace and amen.